Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Dixon. I'm a massage therapist and postural alignment therapist on Nantucket Island, Massachusetts. Um, I started these classes over the pandemic and now I'm able to meet with people, um, but they've been really fun to do. Um, in my 20 years of doing massage, I have actually found initially that most people really benefited primarily from the massage element of things. Over the years with people adding devices and the same repetitive movements that weren't particularly healthy like slumped postures, people started having more issues where they were tight and sore but their issues really required a change in how they moved and used their body to make a big difference. So I have added the postural work into uh, my practice and it makes a really big difference to be able to move, to be able to combine both the hands-on work that I do plus the education in the movement and some suggestions of how someone might be able to move their body better. And that's essentially what we're gonna go over today. Just as a little side note, today's information is mostly for um, informational purposes only. None of these things should cause pain. Please stop right away if they do. Um, in my many years of experience, what I'm going to be presenting today is the average stuff that helps most people. Every single person is unique though. And therefore, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in this class or to email me afterwards. But essentially, if there's any concerns with any of these activities, whether you are healthy enough to do it, please consult with your doctor. Last class, we really talked about chronic low back pain. And if you're having a great deal of discomfort, the same menu or exercise menu can be really beneficial um, and it's listed. Hopefully everyone would have been emailed the PDF that I gave you and there's links in them to all the exercises I'm gonna go over today plus all the information. So if there's any questions, um, you guys are gonna be able to find all of the links in that PDF. Um, so if you have acute back pain, please see your doctor. Um, and, and most people though are okay to be able to do an exercise called static back. So I'll show you static back and diaphragmatic breathing in a, while, in a, in a minute, but the primary reason people have issues are that their body isn't stacked properly. So their bo bodies can be stacked differently um, in different ways for different people. So when it comes to low backs, low backs tend to have to move a little bit carefully and slowly. They get irritated a little bit more often. When the issue is more in this upper back right here, you tend to be able to move a little bit quicker, which is helpful today. So I'm going to be bringing up a little bit of the low back stuff that we went over last time, plus a little bit of the new things for the three primary issues I see people having when they come in with upper back tightness. In the last year or so, I have seen a tremendous amount of upper back tightness as the primary complaint when someone comes in. Additionally, since the pandemic, since people have had a lot more stress, that has probably been their primary concern. And a lot of people aren't even aware of how much the stress or the weight of the world is on their shoulders, but it really does make um, a very big difference in them. So each of the curves in your back are meant to have a purpose, or each of the joints in your back are meant to have a purpose. When we talk about the thoracic area right here, we have a rib cage that goes around and the rib cage is really to protect all of our organs. But in a joint by joint approach, which is um, a famous um, physical therapist, the, the purpose of the rib cage is supposed to be ever so slightly mobile. And most people that have very, very tight backs have not as much mobility. It's a very slight amount of mobility, but their backs are just a little bit too tight. So there's really three reasons that I find that this happens. Now, you're supposed to have the right amount of curves in your back. 
And there's several different places where there's curves and there's negative curves and there's positive curves. So one of the places that people have an issue is, um, is in that they have a really deep curve in their low back and then it's balanced. So if you look at your back right here and you have a really deep curve right here, so I'm gonna really accentuate here, then instead of falling over, I'm going to be bringing my back way back and then I'm gonna be bringing my neck up. So this is a situation where, because of this curve right here and this neck right here, my upper back to keep me from falling over is going to be really accentuated. So this is the first um, of the scenarios that I often see. And ideally in that scenario, we need to get the low back to relax rather passively, and we can work a little bit more actively on getting that lower back to lessen. Now we do want curves in those areas, but we want kind of the right amount. So there's issues if there's too much, and there's issues if there's not enough. But really we just want to be able to be balanced, particularly if there's tension in that area. So some people have lost all the curves in their back and they look more like a slumped C. So instead of having the curve here and here and here, they have a posteriorly tilted pelvis and their body's a little bit more like this. I'm accentuating it, but it used to be what we would typically see in older, weaker people, people that had lost a lot of the ability for their back to sort of function ideally. And they lost the function because their back was really stuck in flexion, but not really any extension. And your back is supposed to move in flexion and extension at each of the parts. Typically, we used to see it just in the older population. And now because so many kids sit slumped using devices and are relatively not very active, we're starting to see it even in teenagers. And it will be interesting to see the extent of issues this provides as our teenagers start to get a little bit older and they start adding even more sitting and uh, less activity into their lives. And then a third thing I often see with tight upper backs is that the scapula themselves, which are the wing bones right here, tend to be out of place. So it tends to look like these rounded shoulders and the muscles of the scapula aren't doing their job properly. So the rib cage itself, the rounded upper rib cage, is meant to be relatively the tiniest bit mobile so it can um, respond to things. And then the scapula on top of it is meant to be rather stable. So it's responsible for the whole arm movement. And if my scapula is out here, my arm isn't really doing its job as it po properly should, and the muscles on either side of the scapula aren't doing their job. If I don't have enough stability in my scapula for down my arm, my rib cage is going to really um, lock up to try to create stability for me. So that's a very common issue. Yes. Um, can you show me like the scapula is where? From okay. So the scapula is the wing bone right here. You know, the, the triangular shape, chicken bone, wing bone. Okay right here. So it's attached to my arm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Sorry. Okay. I was following yeah. you. So when you think of, when you think about it, it's, 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 um, so you have the clavicle in the front, then you have the scapula as it comes across, and then you have where the arm sticks up into it. But in the back, there are muscles on either side of the scapula, and they're meant to be equal. A lot of times, the muscles on this side are really overworking, and the muscles like the rhomboid on the inside are really underworking, typically. Um, okay. I've almost never seen it the opposite. Is so. it okay if I share my specific area that is super tight? Just sure. You get so you can tell me when you get there, but. So in between the scapulas along the spine, like from neck to sort of bra um, mm -hmm. strap area, that part that you can't reach and get in, that's what like grabs. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you 
is something I, I'll appreciate understanding you're talking about. Most but, uh, likely, okay, I'd have to see your low back and I'll be talking about that in just a second, but most likely you have an element with number one and number three, okay? Which is most likely you have just extra tension in that upper back, okay? Plus most likely the scapular muscles are not working quite as well as they should. I would theoretically have to see you to be able to entirely do this. And you're welcome to send some pictures to my email and then I can more decidedly tell you, okay? But the big difference in the couple of ways that I'm gonna work on is, are you a C, okay, which has the posterior pelvis, not a very flat back, and then this big curve, and most people perceive it actually as neck pain, not really upper back pain, um, but it is an issue with the upper back as well. Or do you have, um, if you're sore just between the shoulder blades, a lot of times it's because those between the shoulder blade muscles are overworking and that's going to require some additional um, scapula stability that would help with it as well. Um, a lot of times that C curve back really perceives it as neck pain because the back is here, it's very weak, but the neck is holding a lot of weight. You know, a, a neck this far forward weighs about 42 pounds of pressure on the, on the back of the neck instead of the normal eight to 11 pounds that it weighs. So it's a lot of work that's unbalanced in the upper neck. Okay. Does that answer your question for now? It does, and I have had some things done, so I'm very mindful of tucking the chin and and I do have lower back stuff too, but. Okay. It's very good to tuck the, the neck potentially, but the one thing you want to watch on is that you're tucking the neck over a proper thoracic area. In other words, if I am, um, if I am way over here, okay, and now my neck is really forward and I want to bring my neck into alignment, I'm going to really have to uh, tuck my neck. Can you guys see me? I'm going to really have to tuck my neck to get in alignment, but really the issue is here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing with tucking your neck is you really need to make sure that the basement and the first floor are in alignment first before you tuck the neck. Um, only because uh, you want to make sure that your neck is actually tucked properly. So, all right. So any questions from anyone else on sort of the three ways that uh, I often see people with issues in their low back, and then we can discuss different ways that you might address each one. Good, okay. All right, so a lot of times we have this back that is, you know, you have the curve here, then you have a tight curve here, and this curve is where there's just a lot of tension. Now, this is almost always gonna be an issue if you have a scapula issue as well. And the low back right here, the, the negative curves tend to have to move a little slowly on. Um, they get a little bit pissed off if you work too quickly on it. The upper back, the positive curves, tend to be able to work a little bit faster. And so um, I'm going to go over what is partially a um, passive routine and an active routine to be able to reduce the curve here and let the low back relax. So one of the ones that can do it is I have two different exercises that work somewhat passively, okay? And one is called static back and one is called static wall. And I'm going to show you both of them. And a lot of times people will say, which one should I do? Okay, now some of it is static wall is a little bit trickier than static back. Okay, you need to be able to make sure you have enough space in your back line, and I'll describe that in a second when I'm showing it to you. But these, um, they both produce gravitational force push on that tight upper back to help let gravity relax your back. It's also because we spend so much of our time sitting in a rather <coughs> slumped position as we're on our computers or we're driving around or we're doing something, it allows us to passively at the end of the day, bring our bodies back into neutral, which can be extremely helpful. Almost uh, 
everyone benefits from some form of bringing ourselves neutral after slumping all day long. Now, I'm gonna show you what each of them look like, but why might you choose one or the other? So static back is a little bit easier, okay? You don't have to have as much room in your back line. And uh, you'll feel that as tension in your calves and hamstrings, and you might not be able to do it correctly, okay? If you have, so static back is going to also be better for you if you have one hip that's a little bit more forward and one shoulder a little bit more forward because it's really gonna stack up the shoulders and the upper back, okay? So as I'm lying on the ground, this hip is going to go into alignment, the shoulder is going to go into alignment, and my low back is going to relax, okay? And then if I was in static wall, if I had, my hips weren't so bad, but I had extra tension in this upper back, okay? The gravitation, the um, static wall puts more pressure on the upper back than the static wall. Static, I mean static back, sorry. Static back kind of is the whole back. Static wall puts more pressure on that upper back, so it's gonna work a little harder of the hard ground with gravity to get our back to go. So we're going to be letting gravity actively work on our upper back. Our low backs are going to be able to relax passively, and then we're going to add, potentially, if you'd like to, an element of active work between those shoulder blades to help our upper backs um, work even a little bit faster. So there are different arm movements that would also work well with scapula um, engagement to increase active work between our shoulder blades as we're passively and gravitationally letting our back relax. So let me show you what both of those look like. And in the PDF that you got, there's links to each of these, okay? So I just have to put this on the ground so you can see me. Hopefully, if you guys can't see me, let me know. Okay, so static back is going to be an element where if you have an ottoman or a chair that is the correct uh, position, we're gonna come over here. We're gonna pretty much have right angles and my legs are gonna come up here and I'm just going to have my arms out to the side and I'm just gonna rest here for a little bit. This is perfect for the end of the day when you are looking to, or the beginning of the day, but when you're looking to reduce rotations in the low back, the arch in the back will naturally relax. You don't have to push it down. Any rotations in the shoulders will, will change. And if you have a really rounded back, simply the weight of the ground against my gravitational force weight is going to help reduce a little bit of the tension in my upper back. Now, if you're so much of a curve that my head is now gonna be curved like this, see how my eyes are angled like this? We might want to use a little bit of a pillow to make sure that my head stays neutral. Over time and that reduction of this curve, my head will naturally be able to sink closer to the ground and I wouldn't want to use the pillow anymore because I really want my head in alignment over my pelvis and over alignment of my thoracic area. So when you're in this position, okay, I am using gravitational force to relax here, passively letting my back and I can either rest with my arms off to the side or I could add active work into the muscles underneath my scapula. This is what reverse presses look like. I'm making like a, a wishbone, um, well, like football field, I don't even know what that, goal post. And I'm just going to sort of press my elbows and squeeze into the ground. And that's acting, asking between my shoulder blades to work a little bit or if I can rest my arms just down at the ground, I'm going to glide my arms back and forth, or I can lock my elbows and bring my arms back as far as it can go. 
Now the arm movements can be done in each position. Now I'm gonna show you what static wall looks like. So with static wall, I'm going to come as close as I can to my wall. You do need to have a wall for this, okay? Now I'm going to bring my legs up the wall. Now you, you wanna make sure your bottom is able to touch the ground. So if I was too tight and I couldn't do it, you need to scoop back so that um, I'm able to bring my toes forward and contract my quads. Now I have a lot of activity and I'm gonna feel a big stretch in my back line. And this is the one that's gonna put more pressure on my upper back if I have enough space to have this active leg up the wall, okay? Now my arms can rest at the side or I can use the reverse presses, the arm leg, or the pullover presses. Okay. Any questions on this before we get to the other exercises? How, how long do you use in each? Um, it depends on the issue. So if you had a really sore back and sitting hurt, you would probably want to spend 20 minutes in the static back position. Most people, if they're doing it on a regular day, just to do, you know, like reverse what they gravitational did all day, would probably do it for five minutes or less. Um, but sometimes someone calls me, quite a few people will call me in pretty severe pain, so much pain that I can't really see them right away. And I will ask them to do the routine that um, I list on the first page, which is the static back with diaphragmatic breathing. So, and that I will usually recommend for 20, 30 minutes or as long as you want, because most people will not be in pain. If they're in pain sitting, they won't be in pain and static back typically. And so I will recommend, you know, stay in the static back till you feel those rotations happen. If you're very perceptive of your body, you might feel that that one hip was more forward and then it will almost feel like that hip is pushing into the ground as your body unrotates and your upper back the same way. Um, in the ideal world, you would stay and get unrotated. So, you know, you would stay as long as that. The more often you do it, your body will be faster and faster at doing it and it won't take as long. But at the very end, probably five minutes, would be more than adequate. Okay, also, um, so where you're describing different situations and then giving us exercise choices, uh -huh. is it for somebody who's kind of in one category, it, like are all of these exercises okay to do no matter what your circumstances are? Or one yes, as more? long as they feel okay, you know? It shouldn't, but, but I have to say the ecstatic wall, if you are very tight in your back line, um, which is really the back, you know, the back side of you, it is going to be harder to do it correctly. If you had a tremendous amount of back pain or a relatively lot of back pain, static back is pretty much good for everyone. Static wall is not great for everyone um, because of the, the back line. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is timely. What I want to teach people is to think about what it is they need, you know, and to be able to understand why they might choose that for themselves, because there's more than one way to address any of these things. Even, even with what I'm presenting today, I'm presenting some information of how you could do it, but there's many ways that you could, that you could do it otherwise. And I really want to teach people the skills to be able to also think for themselves um, and to try things differently. You know, a lot of people will find that they get one or two exercises that really, if they do it every day because of their natural body and how they move, and then the issues they have, if they do these, they'll be better, you know. Um, they kind of reverse all the negative things that might happen during the day. Um, for other people, things change a little bit. And I, I like to give the people the skills to be able to figure things out. And you can contact me. This is like general information. And if you want more specific for you, feel free to contact me, okay? All right, so those were 
I call them half passive routines because we were getting in a position and letting gravity work, plus adding a little activity between the shoulder blades to reduce the, the tension in the upper back. Here is a more active routine for upper backs. The active cobra looks like this. So before I was just resting on the ground and letting gravitational work. Now I am going to come right here. Hopefully you guys can see me, okay? So I'm going to come on my elbows. Let me actually press this down a little bit more. So I'm going to come on my elbows and I'm going to let myself sink. I don't know if you can see that I have my upper back right here. I'm gonna keep my neck neutral. So I'm not gonna tilt my head up like this and I'm not gonna tilt my neck down like this. I'm gonna keep my neck neutral. I'm gonna have my elbows into the ground and I'm almost going to press out like this, but I'm not going to go anywhere. So I've created this activity between my shoulder blades and then there's multiple things you can do with your lower body. If your low back can handle this, okay, you could take your feet and squeeze and release, squeeze and release, or just squeeze, or you could just rest your legs down on the ground. Um, but essentially, the work right here is um, my upper back is extending instead of flexing, my neck is being neutral on top of this and this this work that's not going anywhere um, with my with my arms is really helping um, some of that scapula movement okay if your low back can handle it this is also going to be when i squeeze my feet together it's going to be getting the extensors of my lower body to work as well so instead of being stuck in a constant see all the time. I'm really engaging my entire um, lower back line. Another exercise that can be really helpful, it, it's active, but it's not as active as the active cobra. Almost everyone can do this, is called counter stretch. So with counter stretch, I just need to make sure I'm going to take, um, so I'm going to take and hold against either a counter or a wall and I'm going to have locked elbows and I'm going to make sure that my pelvis doesn't go into a posterior tilt. I'm going to keep a little bit of an angle into this pelvis, okay? And I'm going to come right here. I'm going to keep my neck neutral and I'm going to sink back and I'm going to sink between my shoulder blades and I'm going to feel a stretch along my back line. And this is going to be stretching a little bit into my arms. This is going to be stretching into my entire back line. And this can be super helpful anytime during the day. You know, active cobra, very hard to do if you're out and about. Um, if you are out and about on almost anything else, this is very easy. Now, the further down you go, before I was just going on a wall. Now, if you could see me, I'm gonna go on my dresser here. Now what happens is if I come right here, okay, this I can also do. If I find myself going too low, this makes it deeper if I have a half foam roller. So I'm going to go a half foam roller. You're not going to see my feet, but I've added more of a stretch into my back line. As soon as I do that, I don't know if you can see this, but my, my pelvis wants to tilt like this because I don't have enough space. So as I come like this, if my, see how my pelvis wants to round right here, my back? If my pelvis is rounding like this, I don't have enough space in my back line, okay? So now I'm gonna take that away and I'm gonna be able to maintain that arch as I bring my, sort of my butt back actually, and I'm gonna feel a stretch along the back line into the arm. So this is counter stretch and or wall stretch, depending on where you place your arms. And then a third exercise that can be really good for actually strengthening the low back because one of the issues, well, strengthening the quads really, um, is not really the low back, is called um, air bench. And a lot of people have done these before and they don't love them. But 
We're gonna come up against the wall. We're gonna lean against the wall. We're gonna scoot down. We're always going to make sure, you, you can't see my knees, but that my knees are not beyond my toes, okay? I'm gonna lean against the back. I'm gonna actually push my low back into the wall. My upper back can be forward, that's fine. But I'm gonna activate my quads because a lot of times in today's world, we really activate our upper backs. We have these really dominant upper traps. We're really active upper body, but we really haven't activated lower body. So this is a great one at the end of the day to kind of stabilize our quads, turn our entire body on, and you can hold this for a minute or two. It looks like, so I'm pressing my back into the wall and my, uh, well, I'm not against the thing, but you are pressing your low back in, but your head does not have to be against the wall. Um, any questions on any of those exercises? Okay, if no questions, I'm gonna go into active routines for scapula stability. So this is that one where the, the muscles around that wing bone are perhaps not working as well. You will often perceive it as shoulders rounded forward, or shoulders rounded forward like this, and or it will be on top of an issue of either the C curve back or the super rounded back. So these would be in addition to some of the other exercises we would already have done. Um, I'm going to add something called arm circles and elbow curls. So in arm circles, Actually, I'm going to do it kneeling so that you can see me a little bit better. So I'm going to kneel, okay? I'm going to take an active hand, they call it elbow, um, golfer's grip, and I'm going to have my arms out. I want to make sure that I'm not like this, that I'm kind of even, okay? And I'm going to straighten my arms out, lock my elbows a bit, and make little circles in one direction. And my body is going to be moving slightly forward and back. And to a certain extent, this is getting my core to stabilize a very small amount. While I'm asking my shoulders to remain stable and the muscles to work. Then I'm going to bring my, um, then I'm going to point, so my thumb was pointing forwards. Now my thumb is going to be pointing back and I'm going to do circles in the other direction. And a lot of people, you know, the Egoski routine will have people do 40 of these, okay? Most people need to start with like 20. Most people do a much better job forward than back. We don't do a lot of work behind us in today's society. Another exercise that can be really good for shoulder stability on top of the other routines we did was elbow curls. So with elbow curls, okay, the movement's gonna be coming like a hinge from the back, okay? So we have that active hand, but you could also have an active hand like this, okay? And we're gonna bring our elbows together and then open up our elbows back. And the work is all coming from the back. It's not about my wrist moving like this. My wrist is gonna stay locked. And all the movement together and apart. And you will find that you either have trouble getting your elbows together or you have trouble pulling them apart. Usually, you, you know, usually one will have a problem with one but not the other. And this is going to produce a lot of activity between that shoulder blade in the movement that the scapula is meant to have. Any questions on the uh, scapula routines? Yes. Yeah. So I think I can go forward, but when I go back, I feel like a muscle contracting, I think, kind of in here. Yes, there in part because you are contracting a muscle back there, okay? One thing you might want to also do is correct, potentially, okay, I, I don't see you very well, but if your shoulder was really forwards and then you're doing it, you're going to be... Um, you're going to be uh, using the wrong thing. So you can also go on the ground or against a wall, okay? So if I was against a wall, 
Um, I'm going to squat down so you guys can see me better. Okay, normally you might stand up. So now I'm standing up against a wall and the wall is keeping me level. Okay, and now I can do it up against the wall. Or you could do it in a static back position. Okay, where I'm up here. Now I've worked on that rotational stuff a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to work this right here. Okay. So this is where, but at the same time, work to your comfort level. You know, if something is hurting, there can be a lot of things that could go wrong, or there's a lot of nerves that go through this area. There's a lot of muscles. I mean, there's a lot of other things that could be playing in here. You know, if you had a nerve, you might want to use nerve flossing. There's a lot of other solutions. This is using muscles to correct posture. Um, but there could be other things going on as well. But the more that you've already stacked your body properly and then you stabilize the scapula, it's going to be a little bit less likely that it's going to hurt or be uncomfortable. Sometimes too, we're moving in a position that we've never moved into before. And it's good for us to recognize, is this a sensation that we're feeling or is this pain? If this is pain and there's a red flag or it's making us anxious, then stop and listen to it. But sometimes people are so unused to the sensations that they're feeling that they get confused between the fact that you're feeling a sensation because you're using muscles that you've never used before, or this is a red flag, I need to listen to my body and stop. So whenever you're doing any of these exercises, please do think about those two different those two different scenarios. Red flag, stop right away. Is this a new sensation because I'm using muscles that I have never used before? You definitely want to um, maybe be open to seeing how it feels or ease in with numbers, but you definitely want to be stacked already before you add sort of the scapula because it's the same thing with the neck, the neck curls, right? If you were if your body is stacked right here and you're like, gosh, I really want to get my head over, over my thoracic area. So you're going to bring it right here. But if you were stacked up properly, you're going to really be extending your head, right? It's the same thing with the scapula. We want to have a, a, a proper stable scapula, but not over, you know, not over a super rounded back. We want to have kind of the right amount of a rotated back and then produce a, a stable scapula on top of that. Does that help? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I, I'm quite body conscious. So um, this is helpful. So one question. So if we were going to do like, say a little bit of each of the exercises, do them in the order that you put them on the sheet. Potentially. Yes. Um, there's a reason why I put them in that order, but like particularly with the static back, static wall, let your body stack up a little bit and then add, add activity into it. Um, the next routine that I would do, and really we want to do scapula stability on a stacked body. So work a little bit on stacking the body first and then work on stabilizing. Same with stacking the body and then working on neck tucks type of a thing. Okay. Um, Routine for a C-spine. So, so if we have that back, and this was brought up a bit for the last class because it was a low back issue. If you have that really C-spine, a lot of people do feel tension between the shoulder blades, but most people would perceive it actually as a, a neck issue. But these people, these backs really need a gentle back they, they almost, your upper back is going to correct itself if you correct the low back and the neck position. And so I added an element to increase the low back, such as a frog position or a hook line tower rolls, which I will show you in a minute. The active work on the upper back, like the counter stretch and finish with cats and dogs. So the issue with the low back, when the low back is one of the issues in with the upper back is that, Low backs tend to be crankier and need to work a little bit slower, okay? So if you had issues like a stenosis, which is an arthritis into the low back, or even if you have a pretty flat back, so these C-curve backs are gonna have a pretty flat back. 
you just have to go slowly. So I'm going to show you some things that you can do with it, but no, you have to go slowly with this one. Upper backs, you know, that, that positive curve can actually respond pretty quickly. The low back, it's got to go kind of slow. So I'm going to show you some things, but really take a word of caution to ease into these things if this was your issue, okay? So a towel sequence would be, I have, rolls okay these are soft rolls these are not hard rolls okay this would be like a roll towel okay and i am going to make sure you can see me okay so i'm going to lie in a goscu hook lying is just to lie with um my knees bent and i'm going to put one roll under my low back and i'm going to put one roll under my neck okay so I have a roll right here under my low back and a roll under my neck. And this is where I was meant to have those, uh, those curves. And I'm just going to relax a little bit. And this is going to encourage a little bit of lengthening into my back because now I'm asking it to stretch a little bit and I'm just resting passively as I'm asking for a little bit of movement. Now, you would have to ease slowly, you know, like a smaller roll towel to a bigger roll towel. Um, but even so, you're not going to ever use a really big one, okay? But you're just going to rest here. Um, at, but again, listening to your body for what feels comfortable for you. Now, frog, which is an element where my feet are together, and you can do a frog with a towel there or without a towel there, okay? But I'm going to have my feet and just open it up, okay? And what naturally happens, what naturally happens, sorry, my puppy is coming to join us. What naturally happens is that when my legs come forward, hello, um, my back is going to, okay. <laughs> um, my back is going to naturally arch and we want our back to arch right here. We don't want to force it to arch, we want to let it arch and relax and then breathe in this position and this is naturally going to pull on some of the hip flexors and it's going to pull and allow some of that movement okay sometimes backs don't like moving too quickly though so this is where you want to be um a little bit slow the the counter stretch was where we were up against the um we were up against the wall is very helpful for those upper backs and neck position. Sorry, sorry about my dog. He's just not gonna probably leave me alone now. And then cats and dogs, and I'll show you what that one looks like. So the back is supposed to flex and extend at each of the positions. And sometimes, particularly in that sieve curve, it just doesn't extend very often. So cats and dogs, come here puppy, come on, sit, sit is going to be an element, sorry. It's going to be an element where I'm on all fours and I'm going to flex and I'm going to extend. And I'm looking to go through all of the different movements because that C curve back tends to flex all the time. It doesn't tend to want to extend. So once we get a little bit of that movement into our body, we want to really remind the body not just how to flex, but how to extend. Any questions? That last sequence too, same thing on time, like start at five minutes, but stay like on the back, the towel sequence. Probably five minutes. When I, I would have done a, you can also see, see, I have to be a little bit careful about prescribing. Um, mm -hmm. So, so when the link will say what most people do it as, always do it to your comfort level. But yes, it takes a little bit of time to do these things. And most people would relax into them. In other words, they would spend a period of time. And you can listen to books on tape. You could, you know, sometimes you get a little bit stiff. So I would probably start with less and ease in a little bit more. Um, uh, probably not more than five minutes in each of those positions, even just even as you work into it, it would probably be not more than five minutes max. Um, and then also to your comfort zone, if you're pulling a lot more on that low back, real passively, but still pulling on that low back, it sometimes gets a little uh, 
irritated. So just like if you've done too much one day, do a little bit less the next type of a thing. But most people, as long as they ease in slowly, are much more successful at, um, at, at helping their low backs than if they go too quickly and irritate it, okay? The other thing that you could do for low backs, I know I had cat and dog, and it is important to get the whole back to flex and extend, but just reminding, you can also get in what they call a pelvic tilt, which is to lie on the ground in the hook lying position. And I'm not gonna force anything, but I'm going to bring my, just my pelvis, not the rest of my body, through all flexion and extension. And that's a really great activity. A lot of times those flat backs um, don't tend to, you know, be able to move through the body. So it's almost good to start with uh, pelvic tilts like this, and then work into, like driving uh, the cats and dogs, driving initially from the pelvis and then working in to entire flexion and extension of the entire spine. So you're, you're saying do that pelvic tilt before you go into the cat dog? You can, or I would start with maybe the pelvic tilt. And if you had trouble with any element of moving just the pelvis, um, inflection and extension, I would certainly focus on that first and then like add in the rest of the body. So I don't mean, I mean like almost focus for a week or two on pelvic tilts and then ease into cats and dogs. When you really have both the brain and the muscle pattern of flexion and extension just at the pelvis, then put the whole, the whole rest of the spine in with it. Um, because most people um, have less education of flexion and extension at the pelvis and then they usually only have trouble with extension at the upper back and you know if you have if your low back can handle an an active cobra that is working with really educating the the back muscles to extend where most of the other ones were passively working on some other stuff so you know we do want to educate our body to be able to extend that upper back as well while keeping our neck neutral. All right, any other questions or can I get into the tools that are often helpful? So tools that are often helpful, if time-wise we don't get to all of them, they are all listed on the sheet that you should have gotten. Most of them are not different than we did last time, but there's a couple of changes. So heat really helps muscles feel better and increases circulation, increases healing, ice slows down nerve signals, follows safety ideals, does not increase healing. It can be very helpful for upper traps. So if you have a nerve that's pinched, ice is really helpful, but otherwise heat is mostly helpful. Um, when it comes to upper back, massagers can be really helpful. Here is a very powerful one. It's called a hypervolt. When you have tight upper backs, it can be helpful to work on upper traps, which is right here. It can be helpful for pecs, so it would be helpful to work here. And you tend to overuse these muscles back here, so massagers can be very helpful for that. However, when you think about agonist antagonist muscles, the bully muscles tend to be the sternocleidomastoid, the upper traps, and the pecs. So these all get short, and then those guys overwork. And we kind of want to build up the strength of our bullied muscles and open up the, um, and release the bully muscles, okay? So one way that you could work on the bully muscles is to release them with massage and then actively work on those muscles to get the bullied muscles to underwork. Now, the bullied muscles are already overworking, so where massage can be helpful on them is to just release tight tone. They are still tight. It's not that they're not tight, it's just that they're out of balance with these short muscles on the front. Another way that we can work on um, opening up that back, okay, is with the foam roller. Okay, so a very useful way would be to get on the foam roller, okay, to make sure that you're lying down and stable, okay. Now on this, my back is going to 
relax. My low back is going to sink into this thing. I'm having to work my core just a little bit to make sure I don't roll off. Okay. And now I can open up my arms and allow for, um, my chest to open up. Okay. This is a really great place that once your back is relaxed too, you can also work on an element of pelvic tilt on this. So now I'm sort of educating my brain while my core is stabilizing a little bit and I'm lined up on this flat surface, relatively flat, and my arms are stretching at the same time. So this can be a really great exercise for those upper backs, okay? Another way that you could use a foam roller is on the upper back. Now, we don't really want to use the foam roller on our lower back because we don't have the stability in the front. This is kind of open. Rib cage has, it's a very stable area because it has the rib cage all the way around, okay? So I'm going to get only on the rib cage, okay? I'm gonna keep this area relatively stable. I'm not moving this area. I'm gonna be moving this area and I'm just going to sort of open up this area. So my arms are kind of open and I'm gonna foam roll this area and it releases some of that tension. Another thing that can be helpful with backs, okay, is, is when we have too much of this stacked forward, very, very tight upper back area. Instead of our, rib, instead of our vertebrae being stacked on top of each other, they start sliding forward and then they're a little bit open in the back and closed in the front. So you can take a softer towel or foam roller, okay, and lie down on this somewhere from here all the way up to about right here. So let me show you what that would look like. So I'm lying on the foam roller under rib cage area and I'm just going to lie open. And this is going to add a little bit of pressure on those um, really vertebrae and ribs to open up a little bit or to close the back a little bit. And that can be super, super helpful for very tight upper backs that the rib cage has sort of started to slide forward and it kind of opens up the front that's a little bit closed. Um, yeah, so that's the roll towel routine for opening up locked vertebrae. There's other tools that you can use as well. Unfortunately, sometimes these areas are hard to um, get to. You know, it's hard to touch them, which is why massage can be very useful. But lots and lots of different massage tools. This is one of my favorite. You know, I'm able to use it against... That one's big. It's not really meant for most people, but if you simply have tight upper backs, this is the Hometic Shiatsu pillow. It's not plugged in right now, but it has these balls that roll around. Can be very helpful to just release tight tissue in the upper back, the lower back and the upper back. Very, very helpful. Um, for 40 to $50, it's great for tight back erector muscles tight between the shoulder blades and um and for the feet as well 